Uh, thank you for having me. How many of you have heard of deep learning? So, yeah, 99%, pretty much everyone. Uh, very good. Uh, forget deep learning for now. So I'm, going, <laughs> I'm here to talk about something way better than deep learning. So before that, a few words about myself. So 20, 25 years ago, I was doing physics. And like most of my colleagues, I uh, switched to finance. And then almost 15 years ago, I uh, moved to California to do what uh, later and now it's called uh, data science. Um, I also um, founded and organized the, first, the very first data meetup in Los Angeles. And I also been uh, teaching uh, at two universities, uh, one in Europe and one uh, in California. And uh, I think I have some unpopular opinions, which I'm going to express some of them here. <laughs> so don't blame my employer. They are really nice people, and I'm really grateful they let me come here and talk. So uh, how many of you have seen this slide uh, from Andrew Ang? This is from a couple of years ago. So Andrew Ang is one of the most famous person in uh, machine learning, deep learning, AI world. And uh, he's been saying this uh, for many, many years, that basically deep learning beats every other uh, machine learning algorithm, especially if you have uh, enough data. And uh, of course, deep learning combined with, with reinforcement learning and other techniques has, has had a tremendous success in, uh, for example, beating world champions in various games. And uh, also, we hope uh, that it will solve very soon uh, uh, driving, so we don't have to drive. Uh, and some people are hoping that AI is coming very soon, whatever that means. Uh, so I think this is very nice, but, but the truth is a little bit more nuanced. So indeed, deep learning has had a tremendous success in uh, computer vision and also in uh, somewhat in predicting sequences like text, LSTMs, for example, and also combined with reinforcement learning, uh, as I was talking about, uh, it has tremendous success in virtual environments like games, where you can create as much data as you want. But this is not really the case in businesses. And also, I'm kind of skeptical about uh, uh, if deep learning is uh, really AI. So. Meanwhile, some people have, have been doing machine learning for 20, 30 years with uh, practical business applications. For example, fraud detection, credit scoring, marketing, uh, all these areas. Uh, I've been doing machine learning in this for like 15 years. There have been some other people doing this for like 20, 25, and even more years. Uh, also, machine learning has been successful in many, many other domains like telcos, churn prediction, uh, um, insurance, car manufacturing, or any kind of manufacturing of uh, thought uh, detection, and many, many other domains. So uh, a couple of years ago, I, I tried in some domains to beat uh, traditional machine learning algorithms with deep learning, and uh, I, I couldn't. So in some domains, uh, simply other algorithms were, were better. And a bit later, uh, here is Tianqi Chen, who is author of the most popular, of one of the most popular uh, boosting, gradient boosting uh, implementation, has talked at my meetup in Los Angeles. And basically, he mentioned that more than half of the Kaggles are not win with deep learning, but actually with uh, gradient boosting machines. So this is kind of my answer to Andrew Ang's like. So uh, if you have uh, a problem in business where you have tabular structural data that comes from a relational database, then it's much more likely that uh, gradient boosting will, perform, will outperform uh, neural nets or deep learning or call it AI if you really want. And uh, even Kaggle CEO Anthony has been saying that a little bit later, that basically in most of this kind of tabular data problem, 
problems, uh, XGBoost has been uh, the, the winning algorithm in Kaggles. But for some of us doing machine learning for many, many years, this is not surprising. Uh, so here are two papers from 2006, which I consider excellent and still not outdated. So these guys have looked at a lot of algorithms on a lot of data sets and have compared accuracy. And uh, the top algorithms were random forest, neural nets, boosting, super attractive machines. So it's not all neural nets. And uh, I actually been using random forest and gradient boosting around uh, 2007. Those were my first uh, machine learning models in production. And I could obtain very, very good accuracy on various business problems. But Algorithm is not everything. So you need to clean your data. You need to do feature engineering. And if you really want very top accuracy, then you need uh, to, uh, to do many, many models, and you need to ensemble them. So this is how uh, you win a Kaggle, for example. So you do all this work. Uh, and ultimately, you have to do all the work that's done, that's been done Many, many years ago, it was called uh, data mining, and now it's called data science. So you have to explore the data, uh, clean, transform the data, do the modeling, validate the models, and all those things. And ultimately, I would say that if you step back even further, then it's not really about the tools. It's really about uh, solving business problems. So you have to understand the problem and map it in the right way to machine learning. So. Um, but if you really, and this talk is about the algorithm or the algorithms, so if you really want some kind of quick advice on what kind of problems, what kind of algorithms to use, taking all this into consideration, then uh, here you go. If you have tabular data, try forest gradient boosting or random forest. If you have very small data, like a thousand observations, then Almost everything other than linear models, some very simple models, would overfit. If you have a lot of data, then uh, GBMs and random forests will become computationally uh, too much to do. So you are back again to some simple linear models, usually with stochastic gradient descent, because uh, that's the fastest way to, to solve this, and it works on very large data sets. And indeed, if you have image, if you have text, then yeah, by all means, do use deep learning. So deep learning is really the best for that. But a better answer would be it depends. And I think by now you have seen that uh, the title of my talk was completely misguided. It was just to make you come here. <laughs> so gradient boosting is not better than deep learning. It's, better at some problems, and deep learning is better at some other problems. For example, with tabular data, typically gradient boosting is better. With images, deep learning is way better than anything else. So if you have images or some other problems where deep learning shines, then by all means use deep learning. So another thing would be just try them all. So there are like four or five algorithms, and like uh, linear models, random forest gradient boosting. Uh, they are related, uh, neural nets, support vector machines, and maybe uh, logistic regression. So just try them all and see whatever works better on uh, your data. Uh, spend also time uh, tuning the models. Uh, do ensembles. If, you, if accuracy really matters, then you might need to do like 100 models and, and do an ensemble of them. And uh, again, feature engineering is very important, how you map the domain knowledge of your business problem into features, into inputs that can be learned by, by uh, whatever machine algorithm you are using. But ultimately, I've been talking mostly about how to get the most accurate model, but sometimes accuracy is not like the most important thing. So, in some cases, you might be constrained to do a model that you can explain, either because of regulatory pressure or some, something else. Uh, so in that case, maybe a linear model is, is better. So it basically, it depends. 
So let's talk about gradient boosting, though. So gradient boosting is basically the building block is trees. And trees, you can think of it as like a partitioning of uh, the space with splits by uh, various variables at various splits. So basically, from the data, we learn uh, the structure, the tree, uh, all the splits, and uh, uh, also the split variables and the split points. So we learned this from data, and this is one tree. And how do we get gradient boosting from uh, trees? Here in this in is an example of another tree from another problem. And before gradient boosting, I would say a few words about Adaboost. So this, is, this came uh, in 97. So Adaboost builds uh, trees sequentially, and we will average them. And each tree is uh, trying to minimize the errors that the other trees before made. And the way we do this is that those observations that were misclassified by the previous trees they are upweighted so that the next tree focuses more on those trees. And this is how we build tree after tree, and then we stop at some point. And uh, gradient boosting is uh, something similar. We build iteratively trees. I don't expect you to understand this. It doesn't really, you don't really need to, especially in the, the, the first round, to, in, a, in order to, to go and uh, use gradient boosting. But basically, it's... Uh, it's a gradient descent algorithm in the functional space of these trees. More importantly, what, if you want to use gradient boosting, what kind of packages uh, that are open source and are available for you to use? So I talked to people. I uh, looked up Kaggle forums. I looked up on the internet. So which are the packages that people are using? And this. A few years ago, when I did this, these were the ones that most people were using that were open source. And why open source? Because it's free, but not also because of that. Because uh, there are great communities, meetups, conferences like this. Uh, also, there is very good documentation nowadays. So there are tons of books on R, Python, if you do data science. You can ask questions of Stack Overflow. Sometimes you get better documentation than with, with very expensive paid products. And all of these packages are available uh, from R or Python, which most data scientists who are using open source are, are kind of using. So a couple of years ago, I started this little benchmark because I couldn't find any, internet, any information on the internet. Uh, that was kind of comparing these uh, packages. So I kind of put it on myself, but it's still kind of like a limited benchmarks. But if you go to this repo, you would see there are this kind of scalability in graphs that I'm not going to go in much detail now. What's more important is which are the algorithms that are the best. And I think that based on this, all this work, the best are XGBoost, H2O, and then something that came later, LightGBM, that's open source by Microsoft. And all the three packages they have, uh, or libraries, they, they have an R package or a Python package that you can uh, download and start using it in like one minute. So why not Spark? Uh, Kind of interestingly, there is a big difference between various implementations, even that most people implement the same algorithm from the same book. Still, there is like 100x and even a, a 10x and even 100x difference between various implementation when it comes to running time. So you're not going to wait there 100x time if you have a better library. So I'm going to give you a little bit later more numbers on the Spark, but Spark is just not really good for gradient boosting. But OK, so you would say that I have big data, so how can I do machine learning on all this, my big data? So maybe you don't have big data. Or uh, actually, there are surveys that uh, 
what kind of sizes people are using for, for analytics and for machine learning, the sizes are smaller. And especially because uh, you might have big raw data, but uh, when you do machine learning, uh, you don't do it on, on clicks, for example. You do it on users. So you, you do some aggregation of the raw data, some pre-processing, some refinement. And by the time you get to do machine learning, you have this uh, model matrix, or data matrix is usually called, that it's much smaller. It's basically the number of items you are doing machine learning on, let's say your users, and then times the number of columns, the number of features you have. Um, I don't know, maybe a few 10 million users, 100 million users, a few companies have billions of human users, right? Um, and RAM is plentiful and cheap, so you can get hundreds of gigabytes of RAM for very cheap. Also, you can just go to the cloud. This is one provider. And then when I started the benchmarks, this was the biggest RAM you could get on one machine. So this was 250 gigs of RAM. Uh, now, nowadays, you have four terabyte of RAM on this kind of instance. And if you are a special customer, then they give you also like 12 terabyte of RAM in one single machine. And I also looked at how uh, data set sizes increased from the surveys, and it seems like around 20% per year, while RAM on EC2 grew around uh, 50% per year. So RAM grew just way faster, so more and more data actually fits on the RAM on one single server. And th this was kind of controversial, all these things I was saying a couple of years ago, but I think by now people have realized, so this is a survey f on Twitter, <laughs> so probably meaningless, um, done about a year ago. So I asked, what do you care? You want your machine learning to work on bigger data or to be f faster, or you don't care at all? <laughs> so most people want faster machine learning. And Fast matters. We like fast because uh, you need to, when you do machine learning, you need to do cross validation. You might need to do hyperparameter tuning, which means run a lot of models, maybe 100 models. Uh, you want ensembles again. You might need to run hundreds of models. So if one model takes a day, you, that's not very good. So the, the faster, the better. And um, forget my old benchmark, so that was a little bit too broad, so now I concentrated lately on uh, just the GBMs. So here's another repo, uh, comparing just the best tools, uh, not Spark. And then uh, I made this very easily reproducible, so basically there is a Docker file for this, so you can just, with these commands, reproduce all my results on, and you can run it on your data if you want, but this is on some public data set uh, on a million records, 10 million records. So you can see that uh, now LightGBM, which is kind of the newest Chinese tool, is kind of the fastest. Um, also, GPUs is a big high because of deep learning, but actually it's been successful also for other things like SQL and tabular data and also for uh, gradient boosting. So with gradient boosting, you don't get the speed up you get for neural networks. So you don't get 10x, 100x. You get more moderate speed ups, and also these tools are kind of uh, newer, so one, two years old, so they are maybe less mature. But I think XGBoost by now is the GPU implementation is pretty mature, so that's the fastest. And uh, unlike larger data sets, but still if it fits on the GPU, then it can even be the CPU version. But all this kind of depends a little bit on your data and your CPU and GPU hardware. So these are like decent CPUs and GPUs. Uh, also, it's interesting to look at the memory requirement, especially 
on larger data sets. So I upped here a little bit to 100 million records. So you see LightGBM runs on five gigabytes of RAM. So it's, you don't need hundreds of, of gigabytes of RAM, even for pretty large data sets. It's running, though, for like five minutes. So if you need to run like hundreds or thousands of models, then you, might, you can parallelize easily, right? Um, also on GPUs, uh, the best XGBoost runs pretty fast on 100 million records on this pretty good GPU and uh, uses only 6 gigabytes of GPU RAM. Although he here the, the RAM of the, the server is like hundreds of gigabytes, while here the RAM of the, the basically the GPU memory is, is just 16 gigabytes. So it needs to fit on, on the GPU if you want to use XGBoost. Uh, so LightGBM and XGBoost are great. They are the fastest. They are faster than H2O. Yet I like H2O uh, for production things because it's very easy to deploy it uh, and to create like a real-time uh, web service, a RESTful API. So basically, this is all you need. You export the model, you run those things, and you build a WarFi, and then uh, uh, you run your prediction uh, web service, which is listening on a HTTP or HTTPS port. And basically, you, you can get scores with HTTP or S requests. So that's all that's needed. Uh, I have here the full example, including the training of the model. So if you need real-time uh, prediction scoring, RESTful API to integrate with other things, then look at H2O. And ultimately, for machine learning, it matters not only this kind of feature engineering, training, tuning, modeling part, and evaluating the model, but also the deployment and the scoring, and then what we do with the scores. We, we use them in business applications, and we have monitoring and all this. So I have some Spark numbers, though. So uh, people didn't like that Spark. I was saying that Spark is 100 times slower. So I repeated these experiments with the latest version a few months ago. Uh, and it's still like 200 times slower than LightGBM. So you can see that even on larger data sets, this is LightGBM number, this is Spark runtime, this is 200x. And if you have here bigger data, then it's, this is not going to get much better anytime soon, right? So this is like two orders of magnitude, and it didn't really improve. So it's not going to get within 10x, say. And also, like, it has horrible memory management, so it uses about 100x RAM. So uh, it basically, if you run it on the same server, even with hundreds of gigabytes of RAM, it will just crash. It, so this was on a server with a terabyte of RAM. And uh, for, uh, for the 10 million records, it basically it crashed. And meanwhile, IGBM uses like five gigs of RAM. But Spark people will tell me that I have to run it on a cluster. OK, so let's run it on a cluster. Uh, since it's so slow, I'm going to do only 10 trees. Uh, I'm not going to wait for hours or days uh, on 100 million records. It's still running, even with 10 trees. It's running for like half an hour. Uh, now it's using a little bit less memory, so it's not going to crash on a terabyte. If you have a cluster, then you have, then you have even more RAM. So that's going to be fine. However, if you do XGBoost or LightGBM on just one server, uh, 16 cores, it's going to run like 30 times faster, and it's going to use just a little bit of 
memory, so it's way easier to scale up this if you need than uh, to scale out uh, MLlib's uh, gradient boosting machine implementation. And if you have a Spark cluster, you can actually beat it with even like an old uh, low-end laptop. So uh, on one core, 70 seconds versus 300 seconds on the smaller data so that it fits on the RAM of uh, one small laptop. Yeah, I told you it's not going to be popular. So ultimately, doing machine learning in a distributed setting is uh, really hard. So uh, don't blame the developers of Spark for this. And unfortunately, kind of where we are now is that we have tools that have much less features, low, and then they are actually also buggy. So Spark is uh, good for ETL. Maybe it's, I, I wouldn't say it's like the greatest thing, but it's, it's OK for ETL. And then if you need gradient boosting or machine learning, then uh, Spark integrates with H2O and also with uh, XGBoost. So you can use either of those two things uh, from Spark. I didn't test this extensively, but uh, I tested a little bit, and they seemed OK-ish. So I don't know if they implemented all the features and if it's how stable it is in a production environment. But ultimately, what machine learning is, is not about big data. It's more about computation, a lot of computation. So uh, people who know about uh, internal structure of CPUs and memory and memory hierarchy, those are going to be able to write uh, much more powerful uh, gradient boosting and neural network uh, libraries than, uh, for example, something uh, that's been developed with big data in mind. And ultimately, now we are going to the GPUs. And GPUs have proved also very useful for gradient boosting. So one thing as a data scientist I want from my tools is also like a uh, um, very high level API so that I don't need to write a lot of code. So if you use any of this h 2 HGBoost like GBM, then uh, uh, basically training a gradient boosting machine is uh, one, a few lines of code. or I c You can call this one line of code, basically. So this is just you transform it into some kind of data structure that's very efficient for machine learning. And then this is the training. You specify some parameters. I'm going to say a few words about that uh, one slide later. And then here is you train, and then here is you predict on new data. So gradient boosting, they have a lot of parameters. Some of the most important are the number of trees. I explain what basically we're training trees, and we are averaging them. The depth of the tree, the max depth of the tree, uh, the learning rate. This prevents somewhat overfitting. This is the way how we combine uh, the trees. And then uh, something called, called early stopping I'm going to mention uh, very soon, actually now. So um, with gradient boosting, you have the problem, similar with neural net. If you train it too long, then it's going to overfit. So you're going to think that. If you look at the, your training set, you would get better and better accuracy. But actually, on an independent holdout or test set, you would see that basically your accuracy starts decreasing as you are overfitting. So you have to stop here. And basically, if you run it further, you're gonna and you take this all the trees, then you're gonna get uh, lower accuracy, and you just w wasted all this computation time. So stop early. Uh, it's faster. You don't. Uh, waste so much time, especially if you're doing it in the cloud, it's going to cost you money as well, and uh, it's going to get better accuracy. And then doing all this topping in all these top implementations is very easy, so it's just like uh, a few parameters to set up. So look it up. Um, 
tuning, gradient boosting is not very easy. There are very good tutorials, so I'm just going to point two of them. So the slides will be available. So I'm on Twitter. I will post the slides. Um, so just follow me on Twitter, and uh, uh, you will see where are the slides, and you get all these links. Um, a little bit more about tuning. You can do manual tuning, grid search, or random search. If you did grid search uh, up to now, then read this paper explaining why random search is almost always better than grid search. That's all I'm going to say now. And uh, I also have a GitHub in which I've been doing some kind of extensive random parameter search. Here are the parameters. And it gives you an idea of what kind of depths of trees and, and uh, what kind of learning rate is, is best. But you have to experiment with that on, on your own problem. So you would think that if you have a lot of cores or a lot of CPUs, uh, then these tools will be faster, which it kind of depends. So here is XGBoost on 10 million records. So run on one core, two cores, four cores, eight cores, and 16 cores on a CPU. So you see it gets faster. So this is runtime. But um, if you have, happen to have a server that has two CPU sockets, so on, on, in the cloud, most high-end servers, they have multiple sockets, it means that uh, you will experience some kind of slowdown uh, and the slowdown is because between the two CPUs, the inter-socket connection is slower. So if the CPU stores some data on this memory bank, then it would have to go through the other CPU, and it causes a slowdown. So XGBoost is just not written in a way that it's called NUMA-aware that would deal with this thing. And sometimes you get outrageous slowdown. For instance, here is LightGBM on one core, and here it is on a like, on, um, machine with 64 cores. So you would see that from here to here, you get, like, you get 20 times slower if you run on all cores than if you run it on one single core. Uh, here the same, very surprising. So if you think that you would just throw it to the biggest machine you can find in the cloud, then that's not good. It's going to be slower. So uh, also, if you have hyper-threaded cores, then this is going to slow down the things. So what I kind of recommend is basically uh, learn your CPU structure and run, uh, run a training session on just the physical cores of one CPU. For instance, this, this is a... Um, server with two CPU sockets, and these are the hyper-threaded cores, so forget about hyper-threaded cores, and these are the two sockets. So you can run like one training session here, another one here, or you can run different cross-validation folds, or you can run different hyperparameter search, so something that's independent, and there is no communication between these processes and, or threads and those threads. Because if there is, then it's going to be slowed down, just because these tools are not written in a NUMA-aware way. Um, but even if you, write, you run it only on physical cores, uh, so you don't get linear scaling. So you see here, like on one core, two core, 16 cores, you don't get the, on 16 cores, you don't get the 16 times speed up. Uh, I have to speed up a little bit. But here, basically, for instance, on XGBoost, on 10 million records, on one core, if that's the unit, on 16 cores, it's just going to be three times faster. And this is kind of the best you can get. And like on smaller data, it's going to be even less speed up. So mind this kind of scaling things. And if you have to run like hundreds of models at a time, this is joint work uh, with a friend. Uh, uh, then we concluded that the best way to 
parallelize and also to obtain the most throughput if you need to run, let's say, hundreds of models, like in some use cases, is to, to just run one model per core. So uh, that's, that's how you can train most mo more models in the same unit on time on the same hardware. So basically, here is a comparison table, kind of reiterating what I was talking a little bit. So if speed is your, what you care the most, then uh, if you have a CPU, then use LightGBM. If you have a GPU, use XGBoost. If you care a lot about this kind of real-time scoring or production, then use H2O. So this is kind of the same. Um, also, I've been asking on Twitter what things people are using. A lot of my followers using random forest GBMs, not surprisingly. So there's the asterisk. There is some bias here. Uh, also, interestingly, uh, XGBoost is the, still the most used. It became very popular with Kaggles, and it seems like people just don't know about the other libraries, maybe. Uh, but Spark, not very much used. And uh, CPU versus GPU. So uh, this was a year ago. This is like a month ago. So basically, more and more people are using GPUs for uh, gradient boosting as well. And this is, I couldn't do this on Twitter because it has only four. You can only ask a question with four options. So if we included some other libraries, then basically this is the poll results. Again, around 100 people. So kind of people know that those three are the top tools and uh, way less people are using the, the other ones. So by now, GBMs have been around this implementation for like three, four, five years. And people have figured out what's the best. And also, people are using this to win competitions. For example, this was a couple of months ago. And the story here is the same. Do feature engineering, use LightGBM and XGBoost, and then uh, neural nets are not as good, but use them anyway in an ensemble, uh, and then blend all this into an ensemble. And Basically, this is kind of the last slide. So if you have tabular data, then look first at GBMs and not only deep learning. And there are a lot of other repos I have. So this will be posted with the slides. And I think I'm just out of time anyway. So maybe we have time for a question or two. Thank you. We still have a couple of minutes for questions, so please raise your hands if you want to ask something. Yes. Uh, I have a question because you compared uh, the speed of doing uh, machine learning, for example, in AWS and Spark. And did you try also the uh, algorithms provided by AWS? They are also always bragging that they are faster than the uh, open source one and actually better accuracy. So did you try those? I think it's with SageMaker or? Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I was playing a little bit a couple of weeks ago, but I wouldn't say that I really tried it, so. Yeah, if you look into TensorFlow and installing it on, on Python, you see a lot of Fortran code from the 70s of the last century popping up in the background, SciPy, NumPy, and things like this. Do you believe that this could be also applied by the professional numerical uh, algorithm then, and then you get better and maybe complete different results? So for gradient boosting, what takes most of the time with these implementations and on the uh, data sizes I've been talking about, like millions or 10 millions of records, is basically doing each split on a variable. But instead of splitting on any possible data points, 
all these three best algorithms, they are first doing some kind of histogram, and then they are trying all, only those splits. So like 90 plus percent of the time takes in computing these histograms. And uh, basically, this is different from things that have been done in Fortran in the 60s, 70s. I'm really big fan on, 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 of um, not so shiny tech, what works, and a lot of that is written like Fortran code from the 70s. But in this case, is not the case because random forest and gradient boosting comes from the 90s. And these histograms are, are not as easy to parallelize as the neural nets. That's why you don't get the same speed up with uh, GPUs. But still, it's, it kind of helps if you... So it's, it's faster now on GPUs. Uh, but also, they are improving on the implementation as well. But it's not going to get uh, as much of a speed factor as for the neural nets. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. <laughs>